I talk about the Falcon 8, but uh, are you seeing that adoption? I mean, is it starting yeah. to translate? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I see that as it, it's where LiDAR was maybe five, six years ago. Okay. So not 15 years ago where LiDAR right. was. It's, it, it is uh, being adopted, uh, and I expect that adoption rate to continue to grow. Uh, and it's going to impact the surveying side of the business because you're getting a lot of uh, contractors who are buying UAVs to go fly their job, and uh, they're not driving around in a in a four wheeler anymore. And they're flying a UAV. Flying the UAV, job. and then so it was a logical extension to get a rotor one along with your yeah, because it's a little bit different application. Okay, you know? but yeah, the, you. You need to have that family, and I think you'll see the family of uh, aircraft. You know, everybody's going to have either a fixed wing or a copter of some sort, um, and combinations of both. Um, but really, the key is, you know, the sensors that you put on board from an accuracy standpoint, sure. and then really the software. How do you take all that data and, you know, manage the workflow? And then that's where you're going to see the biggest, uh, I think, growth in the UAV is the connection of the software with the UAVs and the uh, scanners and the ability to create 3D models. The two largest manufacturing industries in the world are construction and agriculture. Uh, anywhere from 7 to $10 trillion a year worldwide in both industries. And they're two of the least automated manufacturing industries. So, so it was obvious that uh, steps had to be taken in those industries in order to supply the human demand of, you know, population in uh, 1927. And you might correct me on a year or two, was two billion people. In the year 2012, 11, 12, we reached 12. We reach seven billion people, and by 2030, it's estimated to be 8.2 billion. By 2050, nine billion. We have a huge problem. There's no more arable land, so how do we grow more food on the current land that we have? And if you think it's uh, tough right now with the infrastructure, especially here in the U.S., you look at our infrastructure and how poor it is, and how much improvement we need in the infrastructure. What about infrastructure for the n another 1.2 billion people that are going to show up over the next 15 years. So you're in an industry that is uh, limited in its ability to uh, you know, take care of the human growth, so both in agricultural and in construction. So you expect to, um, to come up with some way to automate those industries to meet that demand. So. I, again, I thought it would have grown much faster. Um, really, the tipping point for the machine control business that we're in happened when companies like Caterpillar and Komatsu and John Deere start integrating those systems in the factories. And so you're starting to see a lot of growth in that area. In addition to that, I, I tell people all the time, the greatest, probably the, the greatest catalyst to our industry was the development of the iPhone because it makes memory cheap, it makes processing power cheap, it makes sensors cheap. Uh, it, it has just revolutionized the space. That it's my entire it's business created, right there. It, it's created the uh, cloud, <laughs> mm -hmm. the ability to stream up and down in high speed. All of those things were created because of the huge uh, application, the consumer acceptance that happened around uh, a device that made us all uh, more mobile. Mm. And, and so that, that to me, so if you're looking going forward in our business, there's no doubt that we've hit the tipping point in the agriculture and construction automation portion. There's a huge amount of growth still ahead of us in the adoption of the instruments we make today. A good example would be the LiDAR. Uh, you know, LiDAR has been a hot point for what? I remember uh, Ben Kassir, I met him first time in 96, wow. when they were coming up with uh, making a scanner. And, uh, you know, unbelievable what you could do, but they cost way too much. And uh, what could you do with all the data that they collected? So with 
devices like this that have uh, accelerated our ability to uh, have more memory, more processing power, you're going to see massive changes in the surveying business with the use of LiDAR. And, you know, you have to see it. The, the whole discussion about uh, UAVs, that, that is going to change surveying the way we know. There's no doubt that the uh, application of GPS into the construction and agricultural industry requires a certain amount of knowledge to get the kind of accuracies that you need, whether it's, um, you know, calibrating a site. Um, so formal education, um, I, I, I think I'm, in past interviews we've chatted about how the surveyor's role is changing. You know, the contractors need that knowledge in order to automate their uh, job mm -hmm. sites, to be perfectly honest with you. So there is no doubt that there's a, an educational need. Us as manufacturers, we're looking at how do we make the device as simple as an iPhone? How does it all become automatic in the background? There's no doubt that the adoption rate is limited. If, if we were just going into factories building things and we were taking the XYZ measurement to a you know, a mill or a lathe and making it a CNC machine, that's a very controlled environment. Construction, you have to think of the bulldozer and the motor grader and all those machines as a CNC machine. They're a machine in the face of the earth. The problem is it's a custom job every time to go somewhere. Mm. And they don't always have the same employees going to the next job site with the knowledge base that's necessary. So it takes a while for that knowledge through osmosis to percolate through throughout the industry and the employees to do it. And I would say to you, where you had surveyors adopting to the change and not fighting the change, things have gone probably smoother than in some areas people want to fight that change because it's, it's changing their environment. So there's been a lot of uh, barriers to overcome, but the benefit is so large that it's just a matter of time. But it's taken longer than expected. With the manufacturers installing in the factories, you know, all of a sudden the adoption rate goes up exponentially. Because people, they, they don't even know what the capability of the machine is. It's integrated into the machine. It's easier for them to use. So that adoption, we've seen a, an absolute tick up. One of the things, obviously the great operator who could cut grade to millimeter level accuracy by the bubble in their butt, as they call it, driving a machine, who had that ability, because the stakes were every 25 feet mm -hmm. apart, you had to have the ability to cut grade in between. That operator, in many cases, didn't want automation because they saw their uh, you know, value in their ability to operate a machine better than anybody else. But... The, the smart ones started applying their capability, as you say, as subject matter expert, to how do I move the dirt around the job site? That becomes more important. So they learn new skills related to the job that they're doing, not just the ability to cut grade, because that, that's been done now by a, an automated system. But what else do they need to do in order to speed up their uh, uh, process on the job? Mm -hmm. So you're... I think you're seeing that across the industry that people are looking at, like in agriculture, driving the tractor is more annoying than anything else, that I have to drive it and then I have to run all the equipment behind me, the planter, the fertilize, fertilizing, uh, sprayers, uh, how much I'm putting on the crops, when I'm turning around at the end of the field, you're able to take that menial task away from the operator and the operator becomes a manager of the entire device. Not so much unlike a machine shop. If you go into a machine shop today, the operators running the machines, they have a huge skill set at operating multiple machines and getting more parts out of those machines. The better operators are always uh, more productive than mm -hmm. the uh, less. So, so it's a transition of the... the um, functions that they have and what they're doing and where they apply their time. But moving dirt around the job site is a huge skill set. To be able to move and fill in and level an area is not just about driving the machine no, back and forth. No, it's managing that it's whole... It's managing where okay. all the material is. So why not spend more time doing that and then you can uh, make the machine more productive than worrying about how to get the blade <coughs> level between stakes that are 25 feet apart. Today, they're getting 100 corrections a second. 
Он mm-hmm. твои идут замечания. We do a lot internal. Um, where we don't have a particular technology, we try to buy the technology. We're not, we don't grow our business typically by buying companies that have existing infrastructure, distribution, and everything, you know, number one position in the marketplace and trying to grow by volume and merge and, um, you know, merge the companies uh, together. Typically, we're looking at solving a problem, and if we don't have the technology, how we acquire that technology to become uh, owned and controlled by what it is that we're doing. We see our future as making unique solutions for our customers. We've uh, purchased uh, three companies in the ag, primarily the ag space, recently. You know, back in uh, 2006, we decided to enter the ag, the precision ag business, and we bought a small company in Australia that had uh, some unique software, uh, variable rate control, which was a, a growing area in the ag business. We had the core sensors and the, mm-hmm. the machine control technology that was necessary, and we said, okay, let's, let's uh, buy it. But it had a unique technology, and you had the uh, tribal knowledge of the industry inside uh, okay. that company, which is a very important part of uh, entering a business. You know, we can make devices, but we need to understand the application. We wanted to see what we could do in the uh, ag space, and that business grew. It's been the fastest growing business for us uh, since 2006. Um, and as that grew, we looked at who the competition is, our main competition, the same one in the machine control business. Uh, how do we uh, go after, you know, grow our business to be a bigger competitor to them? And that was we needed to buy and acquire some uh, expertise in the industry. And we acquired uh, Wachendorf in Germany, in Geisenheim. Wachendorf is the largest supplier of uh, in-cab displays for the agricultural market in the world. Oh, so, wow, okay. you know, the OEM is a big part of the agricultural uh, business, so uh, that was a very strategic acquisition. Um, the second one we did was a company called Digistar out of Wisconsin that makes all the weighing sensors and the yield monitors that go into the combine harvesters. Again, 80% of our customers are OEMs, and we see the OEM as a big integrator in the uh, agricultural business. So it gives us connectivity to those customers, and it also gives us sensors that are now connected in the IoT, or we say IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things, uh, to allow us to connect all those sensors together uh, and do something with the data, uh, obviously, uh, for the farmers and the agricultural industry. And then the third one we bought is a company up in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, called NORAG. And NORAG makes the boom leveling controls for the massive sprayers that uh, spray chemicals, uh, fertilizer on the uh, on the crops. And they're, they're by far the leader in that. And every sprayer today ends up getting a GPS system put on it. So combining those two together and having, in, in that acquisition, it was uh, obviously the technology. They're the leader by far. And it's about getting the distribution to those customers.